Let's look at Isaiah chapter 41. And you and I know that we live in trying tumultuous days. A new crisis seems to await us daily. I think about gasoline and grocery prices. Have you noticed that they're a little bit higher lately? Inflation is prohibiting many people from even being able to buy a home. Mentally ill people walk into a school and murder innocent children and teachers. Schools encourage their students to choose their own gender, while politicians in California seek to pass an infanticide law to kill children. What can regular people like you and me do? At Bellevue, we're walking through the prophetic book of Isaiah. We're not looking at every verse, but we're going to look at 40 some odd. Do you know what some odd means? That's a Greek word for so-called or about that many 40 verses that we're going to look at, 40 texts. And as we walk through it, we're going to get the heart of God as he spoke that word through Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah served as a priest in Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. He prophesied for about 35 years from 758 B.C. to 698 B.C., and he lived in tumultuous days just like you and I do. He served under five kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh, and Manasseh would eventually kill him as a martyr in a terrible death. I won't describe it, it was horrific. But it was during Isaiah's ministry that two pagan nations, Assyria and Babylon, were defeating all the nations around Judah. And in the midst of all that chaos, God reminded his people through Isaiah that he, the Lord, reigns. Aren't you glad that the Lord reigns? Can we say that together? The Lord reigns. Let me share with you four things. First of all, the Lord reigns over history. The Lord reigns over history. Look at the first four verses there in Isaiah 41. First of all, he says in verse 1, coastlands. He's talking to the pagan nations. Listen to me in silence and let the peoples gain new strength. Let them come forward. Then let them speak. Let us come together for judgment. The setting here is likened to that of a trial in a court. God is the judge. And he's calling to the pagan nations, testify against me if you can. He says, listen to me in silence. That's a way of God saying, I want you to be quiet while I speak. Let the peoples gain new strength. Let them come forward. Then let them speak. Let us come together for judgment. All you pagan nations, come, speak a word against me. Tell me what your complaint is. How have I wrongly condemned you as sinful? You have broken my commandments. I have not misjudged you by calling you wicked. And right now is your time of judgment. Look at verse 2. Who has aroused one from the east, whom he calls in righteousness to his feet? He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword as the wind driven chaff with his bow. Now, who's he talking about there? He's talking about, the Lord was speaking about Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia. The Lord was using this pagan king to do his work. The Lord had called Cyrus in righteousness to come to his feet, to come to the Lord's feet. And Cyrus was just a pawn in the hand of the Lord. I'm sure Cyrus thought, man, I'm good. I, boy, my armies are good. And he didn't know that God was behind it. That's why he was good. 
The Lord used him to accomplish his will among the nations. I want to say this to you. History is his story. History is his story. God is in charge. The Lord used Cyrus, wicked pagan Cyrus, to conquer all of Judah's enemies around her. He delivers, delivers up nations before him, subdues kings. He makes them like dust with the sword as the wind-driven chaff with his bow. And everybody who opposed Cyrus wound up opposing the Lord, and that never goes well. They were all defeated. Verse 3, he pursues them, passing on in safety by a way he had not been traversing with his feet. The Lord used Cyrus to chase away all of the enemies of God's people in Judah. The Lord used a pagan king to defeat them because they had harassed his people. Look at verse 4, who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first and with the last. I am he. The Lord was saying, I, I've done all this. I'm in a class by myself. I perform and I accomplish and I call forth nations to do my will from the beginning of all generations. Can you even fathom a God like that? Sovereign, in complete control of history. He is affirming who he is, who he was, who he will be. I am the Lord. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the eternal God. I have no beginning. I am the eternal God. I have no end. You can't impeach me. I'm not going to resign. You can't kill me. I'm not going to die. And I'm sure not going to commit suicide. I am God. I've always been. And long after you're gone, I'll still be here. That's who's talking. I'm he, I'll never die, I'm eternal. I sovereignly rule over history. In recent days, I've had a real blessed experience to meet one of the greatest men of God of our time. You might not even know him, but his name is Dr. R.T. Kendall. He's going to preach here at Bellevue on the 31st of August at Awesome August, Wednesday night. He will be, at that time, next month he turns 87. 87. That was my football number in college. Doesn't mean anything. I just thought of it and it came out, all right? <laughs> just one of those things that happens with my little brain, all right? For 25 years, R.T. Kendall served as the pastor of the wonderful Westminster Chapel in London. He followed Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Dr. Jones, Lloyd-Jones chose Dr. Kendall to be his successor at Westminster. And he has written over 80 books. Many folks have not read 80 books. But R.T. Kendall has written more than 80 books. And one of the books he wrote about finishing well, he took... Yogi Berra, he knows Yogi Berra, he knew Yogi Berra while he was alive, and he took the title of Yogi Berra's famous statement, it ain't over till it's over, and he wrote a book on how to finish well. And here's what he said regarding how God sovereignly reigns over history. God has a purpose in what he allows, no matter what it is and however disappointing, whether great or small. I truly believe that whatever happens comes within the scope of the permissive will of God and with a hidden purpose he already planned. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. Aren't you glad for that? This means that God has a strategic, thought-out purpose in allowing things to happen. I did not say that everything that happens is predestined. Some Reformed thinkers might say everything is predestined. I am not saying that. If you ask... What is the difference between what God causes and what he permits? I will answer, I do not know. The difference between what God predestines and what he permits is holy ground. Take your shoes off. Don't try to figure it out. Even a theological Einstein can't explain this, believe me. He's saying God is in control of history and nothing happens without, outside of his permissive will. 
Just because God allows something doesn't mean he predestines it. God allows sin, but God certainly doesn't predestine sin. We know that. He's not the author of sin, but he does sovereignly reign over everything, including sin. And aren't you glad that in the end, God will get all the glory and all the victory? We don't understand these things. We can't understand God. But we do know that he is in charge. And we do know that Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. Could we read that off the screen? Read it with me, please. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Everything that happens is going to work for good in the end. Our sovereign Lord reigns over history. He's sovereign and he's Lord. He's the eternal God. Isaiah 44, verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. There is no God besides me. Revelation 1, 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come. I am the Almighty. And the Bible ends, almost the last verse of the Bible is Revelation 22, verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. No one, no one has always existed except the Lord. Everything that happens is not predestined, but God does reign over history. Secondly, the Lord reigns over idolatry. Worshiping anyone or anything that we place above God. That's idolatry. Look at verse 5. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near. They have come. The coastlands and the ends of the earth are again referring to pagan nations other than the nation of Judah. He said, they have seen, they are afraid. They feared the sovereign Lord who was reigning over the people of God in Judah. Verse 6, each one helps his neighbor and they say, says to his brother, be strong. They know that God is powerful and they know that he is going to come against them and they know that they're going to have to stick together, but they don't know that they don't have a chance of defeating the Lord. By opposing the Lord and his people, they sealed their fate. Look at verse 7. So the craftsman encourages the smelter. And he who smooths the metal with the hammer encourages him and beats the anvil saying of the solder, soldering. It's good. And he fastens it with nails, and then Isaiah includes, so that it will not totter. All those pagans trusted their idols, and they said, our idols whom we have made are going to defeat the Lord and his people. But Isaiah tells us just how weak those idols and pagan gods are. Those so-called gods were created by man by smeltering and smoothing and hammering gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. And Isaiah made fun of him and said that those so-called idols are so powerful, they have to nail them down or they will fall over. Not much of a God. On the one hand, the Lord sovereignly creates and reigns over his people, Judah. But on the other side, the pagans create their own gods who have to be nailed down so they won't fall down. Isaiah said, the Lord reigns over idolatry. Now, when we think of idolatry, we say, Brother Steve, we're not like a, a bunch of pagans. We, we don't bow down to some form of Buddha. We don't bow down to some idol out here you know we, we don't do that we're sophisticated oh are we it's not just bowing down to an image it's bowing down to anything that takes the place in your life of God and don't tell me America is not filled with idolatry we are filled with idolatry dare I say it what about sports What about sports? People watch in person, on television, online, 
football. I love to watch football. Basketball, baseball, tennis, golf. They spend hours, multiple hours and multiple thousands of dollars to watch these games. And many times they allow their children to participate in sports that take place on the Lord's Day. And they get involved in things that take them away from the will of God and from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not in some way a form of idolatry? Anything that replaces the Lord in your life? Well, as long as I'm down in this hole, let's go a little deeper. <laughs> what about electronic devices? Computers, iPads, cell phones. Constant texting. And getting mad if somebody doesn't return your text within five minutes. <laughs> Calling people, emailing people, scrolling the internet, checking your calendar. The next time you go out to eat, look around the restaurant and see how many people are staring into their phones while people are all around them. Ignoring those people to look at their apparatus. We were in Florida last week, and I'm telling you on the beach, here's what it looked like. <laughs> they may get tan on their legs, but they're not going to get tan on their face unless it's reflected off of their phone, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then there are the people that drive and look at their phones. They call it rubbernecking. I call it dangerous. Oh, I've got this. Leave me alone. I've got this. Yeah, you've got this. <laughs> You're going to get everybody hurt if you don't stop it. Can't even drive without looking at our phones. And then, as long as I'm down in this hole, let's go a little deeper. Social media can be an idol. Many teenagers today have been cruelly bullied on social media. Some have even committed suicide. It's not just the children that can be mean on social media, it's the adults as well. People will say things on social media that they would never say to your face. There are a lot of people on social media, they look like they're six foot eight, 250 pounds, and you see them and they're five, five, and they weigh about 102, all right? Oh, they're so bold with their words. Other things can be idols. Food can be an idol. Whether you know it or not, family can be an idol. We don't like that one. We don't like to talk about that. Work can be an idol. Go to the next one, would you please? Okay. Health and fitness can be an idol. I hear some of y'all is that? I'm good on that. <laughs> I'm good on that. <laughs> Recreation can be an idol. Finances can be an idol. I mean, anything that you give more attention to than you do the Lord can become an idol in your life. The Apostle John wrote five of the New Testament books. His first epistle, he ended it with th these words. I want you to see it on the screen. 1 John 5, 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God of eternal life. And then he ends the whole epistle with these words. It's just like he just says it. All I'm trying to say is this. Little children, guard yourselves. Guard yourselves from idols. Don't worship anyone. Don't serve anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is not number one in your life. Don't ever say that because the Lord is in a category all his own. He's not just number one in your life. He is in a class by himself. Nobody's close. 
There is no close second to God. The Lord reigns over idolatry. Number three, the Lord reigns over his people. Beginning at verse eight, God turns away from coming against the pagans and the nations and starts to encourage his people. Look at verse eight. Get ready to be blessed. This is some of the best texts, some of the best texts in the whole book of Isaiah. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Now, what's that all about? The Lord is the one who changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. And when the Lord, I believe it was the Lord Jesus, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, wrestled with him at Peniel, and he changed Jacob's name. He also touched his hip that he limped the rest of his life because we read in Hebrews 11 that he died leaning on his staff. He was still limping when he died. Some of y'all say, I want the Lord to touch me. You better watch out what you ask for. He may give you a Jacob's limp. But Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and now all the descendants of Abraham coming through Jacob, who was Israel. And he said, you're the ones I've chosen. Verse 9, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. If you're a child of God, God has chosen you and he has not rejected you in Christ Jesus. He has not rejected you. He has chosen you. And then look at verse 10. I'm telling you, uh, this, this is one of the most amazing verses in the whole Bible. I want us to read it together. This one is special. They're all special. But this is, in my opinion, one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Read it with me, please. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Can we just thank God for that verse right now? Amen. Amen. The Lord was strengthening his people. He was upholding his people. Next time you think things are out of control, just remember you are held by the sovereign hands of Almighty God. Verse 11, behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonor. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. Verse 12, you will seek those who quarrel with you, but you will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. Verse 13, for I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Verse 14, do not fear. What do you think he's saying here? I think he's saying don't fear. Don't fear, you worm Jacob. You men of Israel, I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And then the Lord went on to promise them that he would make them successful. Look at verse 15. Behold, I've made you a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them and will make the hills like chaff. Verse 15, you will winnow them and the wind will carry them away and the storm will scatter them, that is your enemies. But you will rejoice in the Lord and will glory in the Holy One of Israel. Due to your suffering at the moment, but I'm coming to help you in your future. Verse 17, the afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there's none. And their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer myself. As the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. And then God promised to miraculously work on Judah's behalf. Look at verse 18. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. 
I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. If you ever go to Israel, you're going to find out it's in a very arid, desert-like place. It, it, it's very hot and there's very little rain during the year. And water is precious. The entire Middle East is filled with deserts. And God says, I am going to turn all of those deserts into overflowing fountains. I thought about the hymn that we sing, that come thou fount of every blessing. God is our fountain of living water. And then he says in verse 19, I will put the cedar in the wilderness. I will put the acacia and the myrtle and the olive tree. Those trees don't grow very well in the desert sand, but God's going to do it anyway. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress. God says, I'm going to let these trees grow bountifully out in the remote desert, in the wilderness. All of this is going to assure you that I am reigning over you. Verse 20, that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. I want you to know God is in charge. The devil doesn't want you to consider how good God's been to you. How many, how many of you would say, God has been good to me? Anybody out there? Amen. Every day, I say something like this. Lord, thank you for food to eat, clothes to wear, a roof over my head, but way more than that, thank you that my name is written in the book of life. Let's thank him for his blessings right now. Amen? Amen. Now, the devil, devil doesn't want you thinking like that. He doesn't want you thinking about how good God's been to you. He wants you to think about all the bad things that have happened to you. The devil wants you to complain. He doesn't want you to give thanks. He wants you to be discouraged. He doesn't want you to walk in hope and in courage. He wants you to live in fear. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you to walk in in faith and freedom. He wants you to be negative, have negative thoughts about yourself and other people. He doesn't want you to have hope for your future. But the Lord does. The Lord wants you to have hope for your future. He wants you to rest in the fact that he is reigning over you. Right now, if you put all these verses, I just wrote it out, listen to it. Here's what he's saying to you right now. Receive this from the Lord right now, right out of the Bible. I'm going to read you just a synopsis of these scriptures. He's saying to you right now, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You shall seek those who quarrel with you, but will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear Fear, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made you a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. You will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. I'll put the cedar in the wilderness, the acacia and the myrtle and the olive tree. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress and that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Praise the living God. That's right out of the Bible. The Lord's going to take care of you. Every need that you have. If you're hungry, He's going to feed you. If you're thirsty, He's going to give you drink. If you're lonely, he's going to embrace you. If you're in trouble, he's going to rescue you. If you're discouraged, he's going to encourage you. If you feel rejected, he's going to receive you. And when other people push you out, he will pull you into himself. And there's nothing like being pulled into the presence of God. 
Don't try to defend yourself. Don't fear for yourself. The Lord reigns over his people. If you're a child of God, you're in the sovereign hands of God. The Lord reigns over history. The Lord reigns over idolatry. The Lord reigns over his people, and the Lord reigns over his enemies. Look at verse 21 and following. Present your case. He's talking now to the pagans again. The Lord says, bring forward your strong arguments. The king of Jacob says, verse 22, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome, or announce us what is coming. He said, if you're so wise, you wicked people, tell the future. Tell, tell me what's going to happen in the days to come. Declare, verse 23, the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. Indeed, do good or evil. Do something, he's saying, that we may, be, that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Then he began to mock and malign their idols in verse 24. Behold, you are of no account, and your work amounts to nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. He's talking to the idols. I've aroused one from the north. That's the Assyrians, Cyrus. And he has come from the rising of the sun. He will call on my name. He will come upon rulers as upon mortar, even as the potter treads clay. Who has declared this from the beginning that we might know, or from former times that we might say he is right? Surely there was no one who declared. Surely there was no one who proclaimed. Surely there was no one who heard these words except God. Formerly I said to Zion, behold, here they are. And to Jerusalem, I will give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there's no one. There's no counselor among them who, if I ask, can give an answer. Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. The Lord said, I'm Lord over history. I'm Lord over idolatry. I'm Lord over my people. And I'm even Lord over my enemies my enemies. I'm Lord over people who come against my people. I'm Lord over people who come against my word. I'm Lord over people who walk with the devil instead of with me. You know, there are enemies of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Paul said in Philippians 3, 18 and 19, for many walk, not just a few, but many walk of whom I have to often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame who set their minds not on heavenly things but on earthly things but even though enemies will oppose God, and even though enemies will oppose God's people, because Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, and rose from the dead that we might have eternal life, the Lord reigns and rules even over his enemies. I said it at the beginning of the service. I'll say it again. We live in tumultuous days. We are divided. We are depraved. And we are living in a disobedient, divided, depraved world. But here's one thing you can bank on. The Lord God reigns. The Lord God reigns. Does he reign over you today? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? This is my Father's world. And to 
my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Oh, this is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hands the wonders wrong. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols praise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I can hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Let's stand and let's sing the last verse. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the Praise the Lord that the Lord reigns. Amen.